Hi guys, I want to talk about fullers for a second. So here's a quick video discussing the concept of putting a fuller in a sword and what it does to it. A lot of times everyone thinks of fullers as strictly weight saving techniques. So let's say we have a sword like this beautiful Jian from Swordmaker LK Chen. This is a Ming Dynasty um, Jian called the White Serpent. And it's a cut and thrust sword, it's double edged. And it has a diamond cross-section or a rhombus cross-section. So let's say we have a sword like this, and we just want to put a fuller into it. What would happen to a sword like this if we added a fuller to it? Or if we were a smith starting with a sword, and we thought about adding a fuller? Why would we do that? It's true that it is a way of potentially um, saving weight, but in what regard? What what are we trying to accomplish? It's not it's not the same as pulling metal out. We're usually not scraping it. You're usually hammering the sword and and flattening the blade. So just earlier, I got to see a beautiful illustration put out by Maje Kopchu uh, from the art of sword making. Um, he added this to his social media and his Facebook, and it's comparing the cross sections of two very similar shaped. Um, swords. One is a, an oak shot type 10, so not unlike what we would see around the time of the Norman Conquest, so kind of late uh, Viking period swords into the early medieval period, and he's comparing it against a type 15 sword. Now, ostensibly, type 15 swords, much like the like the Jan, are are going to be in a rhombus or or um, a um, a diamond cross section and everyone of course knows that you have a diamond cross section with a nice pronounced rib mid rib to be able to make it better at thrusting right well let's let's take a look at these two swords let's let's see what's going on here so if we look at the wider of the two cross sections both of them have the same cross sectional area so you can imagine that the mass of these two blades is about the same. There are 167 millimeters, 169 millimeters. So the amount of material in each is the same. We're just looking at very different types of shapes. So imagine that we started off with the diamond section, and just like I was discussing with the hypothetical Jian, and we're turning it into the type 10 blade, um, because you can see that they're of similar width. What's happening here? As the smith hammers out the middle the and puts the the fuller into the center and pushes down the peaks of those pyramids it forces material towards the edges this serves to reinforce the edges it actually makes the edges of the blade stronger it makes the the blade have a a tougher more durable edge by making the more material go out towards the, the cutting portion of, of the blade. Imagine for a second that this is the, the blade that I have. So we have the same amount of material, and I'm exaggerating it, but we're squishing out the middle to make a fuller. And now what I have is more material here at the edges. And that's what's happening here. A corollary of this is that you now have a more obtuse primary bevel going from the the thickness um, because you have um, five millimeters of thickness at the edges of the fuller on the type 10 blade but have much less width to get down to the to the tips than we do from the six millimeters at the peak of the midrib on the type 15 to go all the way to the edge. So believe it or not, the diamond cross section sword actually has a much finer cutting angle and is more like a, uh, I don't know if you want to say a fillet knife, but it, it's going to be a, a, more, a more keen cutter with more delicate edges than the type 10 blade. And to some degree, you can see that that continues even through the, the second cross-section. So um, it doesn't say exactly how far up the blade the second section was taken, but at a different point, you can see that the Type 10 turns into a lenticular cross-section. So further up the blade after it loses the fuller, 
it turns into uh, a, a lens, uh, a, a lenticular section, and it has 45 millimeters of cross-sectional area. And the same is true for the Type 10 blade. It has around 43, so just about the same amount of area. But you can see that it's not nearly as wide. It's much narrower um, because the same amount of area has to be taller to ha accommodate the pyramidal, uh, or I'm sorry, the um, diamond cross section. Um, the, the same thing is true. Uh, you end up with a slightly more robust edge having it um, kind of apple seeded off in the lenticular shape on the Type 10. Um, not to say that you can't still end up with a good cutting sword, but it probably would end up slightly more durable depending on what you're planning to go up against um, as far as this cutting performance is concerned um, than, the, um, than the Type 15. So a little food for thought. This is something that's often overlooked. I've heard uh, Peter Johnson talk about this phenomena. There's a few others that have discussed it, but oftentimes when we're talking about fullers, um, especially broad fullers like this, many times people are only thinking of, of it as a cost-saving measure. Sometimes people talk about it as a, a, a means of structural uh, improvement, so a means of making the blade stiffer. And it's true, you could you could make a, for, for the uh, amount of material that you have, if you want to improve the, the strength of it, you can add a fuller so that it doesn't end up real floppy if you just made it flat. You can compact it a little and make it like an I-beam, as goes the, uh, the expression. Uh, but this is something else that's also very important, the concept behind redistributing the mass and pushing more of it towards the cutting portion to reinforce the the edges. So anyway, just a short one this time, just wanted to discuss what a fuller can do depending on the type of fuller and the type of sword we're looking at. Until next time, guys. Take care.